So, Mike, welcome to the show. Um, just to start off, maybe just introduce Thank yourself you. and um, what today's topic will be. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Glenn. Uh, thanks for having me. And I, I want to say I enjoy your series quite a bit. I've been learning a lot. It's nice to hear what other people think too. And uh, what I'm going to talk, what, what am I? I'm a, basically, I would call myself a theoretical statistician more than anything else. Uh, you'll, you'll see from my talk, the kinds of problems that I'm, that I'm interested in are, are really about, you know, the foundations of statistics. What is statistics all about? How should we be, be thinking about statistics, if you like? And uh, this grew out of, I've been in, in the field for 40 odd years, and uh, I got interested in this right from the very start. And I'm not overly happy with the various methodologies or frameworks that have been put forward. So inevitably, I started to develop my own. And what I would like to do now is just give a, a broad sketch of what that is. I'm not expecting people to be able to grasp all the details. Hopefully, they'll go to my website and... Um, and they can download papers there. Some of them are written um, as explanations to a broader audience of, of what this is all about. So I'll start up. So the title of my little presentation here is The Measurement of Statistical Evidence as the Basis for Statistical Reasoning. So there's two aspects of that title that are key to what I'm going to talk about. First of all, there's statistical reasoning. What I'm looking for here is not necessarily a, just a, a theory of statistical inference, but the whole package. How are we supposed to approach a statistical problem? And the second part of my thesis, and that is one thesis, if you like, that that's what we should be talking about in statistics. And the second part of, of that is, well, I think that whatever that theory of statistical reasoning is, it should be based upon characterizing or measuring statistical evidence, something which I think our field is a bit vague about. And you can go to my website and look at papers there. There's lots of papers on this stuff. And this is I apologize, but a very brief sketch, and you won't certainly, you know, if it's new to somebody, they won't get all the details. That's for sure. Okay, so the basic problem. So this is, you know, these are all my particular points of view, right? So please um, take them in that spirit. Uh, what I consider the problem in statistics is it's the, mo the most important, just the quote here, the most important con contribution that the subject of statistics can and should make to science is the provision of a theory that details how one is to reason in contexts that we identify as statistical in nature. So I realize I would have to talk somewhat about what it means for a problem to be statistical in nature, but I'm not going to do that here. Do we do this? I think the answer is equivocal at best. And so that's what concerns me. Uh, so what is the basic problem we are trying to answer? And I, I express it in the following way. In a scientific context, there are questions concerning an object of interest, which I'm just going to call psi, whatever it is. Could be a graph, could be a mean, could be a variance, could be a quantile, or you know, whatever. And we have data X that has been collected, and we believe this data contains evidence concerning the answers to a couple of these questions. What are the questions? Well, there's basically two that I can see. The estimation question, which I'll denote by E. You want to provide an estimate of psi based upon the data. And I also want to see something about how accurate my estimate is. So there's two parts to that, to answering that question. Similarly, with hypothesis assessment, perhaps there's a theory that suggests a value, which I've denoted by psi naught of cap psi. And I want to say, do I have evidence in favor of that hypothesis being true or evidence against? And again, just like with the estimation problem, I want to say something about how strong I believe that evidence is. So there's, there's two aspects here that are a little different maybe than other approaches to this problem. I want to be able to say I've got evidence in favor or against, and I want to say something separate from whatever that measure, whatever that determination might be, how strong that evidence is. Um, well, one thing for sure, if, as a statistician, if we want to be able to devise a theory to answer those questions, we have to assume that the data is being collected correctly. That's something one learns in statistics right from the start, and uh, that's what we might call as a subfield of design of experiment. And one aspect of that, sort of a key aspect of that, is we're supposed to be randomly sampling from various populations. Now, the truth is, in most applications, many applications at least, 
That's not true. Okay, that, that raises an important point, and it's an important point about my presentation, too, because I'm going to be talking about the ideal situation. I'm not trying to cover every problem that a statistician may encounter in their, in their career, which may be very ill-defined, badly collected data, etc. Uh, I, I think whatever the answer is at the core, which is when everything is the way it should be, that must have an influence on what we do when things aren't what, the way they should be as well. So please understand that everything that I'm saying is, is somewhat idealized. You know, what we have to do when there are these assumptions like random sampling aren't met is we need to say, admit that, apply various caveats to whatever we conclude, and maybe there's methodologies also that we can employ to address the issues that might arise in such context. But anyway, here, the data is collected correctly. Uh, so the other part, as I said, of my thesis is However, we answer these two questions, I want it to be based upon statistical evidence in the data. I want to characterize, measure, characterize the evidence in the data as clearly as possible to answer both questions. And that's this topic of a book uh, called Measuring Statistical Evidence Using Relative Belief that I published back a few years ago. And much of, many more, I'm not going to do any examples here. There's many examples in there and much more detail on, on the whole thing in that book. So please have a look. Also, the papers, as I said, on my website. Uh, so if I could do get this theory just based on the data by itself, well, that would probably be ideal. I don't have to add anything to the story. Because when I add things to the story, uh, the possibility are, is that the things that I add are erroneous in some sense, or arbitrary, or whatever bad word you want to apply to it. But I don't know how to do that. So... I'm going to have to add some things. And I'm going to try and add, I've got some characteristics of here of these ingredients. First of all, I want the smallest number. The smallest number I need, going back to my central thesis, to characterize statistical evidence. Okay? Uh, secondly, these ingredients, where do they come from? Well, they're choices. They're choices that an analyst makes, a statistician makes, or a committee makes, or whatever. Uh, is it possible that these ingredients could be chosen such that no matter what the data is, the answers to E or H are foregone conclusions? Foregone conclusions with high probability. Well, surprisingly, perhaps the answer to that is, well, maybe it's not that surprising, but the answer is yes. That's possible. So we want to be able to assess whether or not these ingredients are inducing this thing I'm calling bias, which I will define later. The third thing is, I want these ingredients to be falsifiable. I've said the data is collected properly. Part of collecting the data properly means that the data is presumably objective. It does not depend upon the analyst, right, the statistician. So I want to be able to assess these ingredients against the data to see if there's any indication that these ingredients that I've chosen are, well, they're, not, they're never correct, and sometimes it's not even clear what correct means, but at least they're not contradicting. They're not contradicted seriously by the data. And there may be other things that we want as well, but those three are, are pretty important. Now, what are the ingredients that I'm going to use? Well, as traditionally in statistics, I'm going to have a collection of, what I call them conditional probability distributions here for the data. One for each value of something I'll call the model parameter, theta. And I'm going to want, and I, such that I can express this object of interest as a um, function of the parameter in some sense. Uh, specified by the true, val true distribution in that family that gave rise to the data. And of course, that's falsifiable. It satisfies that criterion by a model checking. Something that's part of the reasoning process, right? The statistical reasoning process. We pick a date, we pick a model. After we've collected data, we're supposed to check to see if that, that it makes sense in light of the data we've observed. Secondly, to get to this definition of evidence or characterization of evidence, I need a prior probability distribution, something that rel relates uh, what my beliefs are about the true value in the parameter space. Is that falsifiable? Yes, it's falsifiable via checking for prior data conflict. Now that, here we come, you know, what does it mean for prior to be true or correct? That's not really what I mean by falsifiable here. I just want to know, is the data contradicting my choice? And in, in the case of checking for prior data conflict, which is something I've worked quite a bit on, uh, 
Uh, it means that there's an indication that the truth lies way out in the tails of the prior, and there's some bad consequences that arise when that's the case. So the prior is indeed falsifiable. I had a hard time with that initially when I started working on it. Some, many people told me, you cannot check priors. Well, that's not true. And you can even prove consistency results about how one goes about checking for priors, that we will be able to assess whether the truth is in the tails or not by the check, in other words. Also, just for, go ahead. Just, yep. yeah, yeah, just for quick clarity on that, uh, when people are saying you cannot check the priors, or they mean that you cannot check the priors for conflict with prior data, or alternatively that you can't check priors with respect to the data currently under analysis? That's a good question. I don't know exactly what they meant by it because it was always pretty clear to me that you could check whether or not the data that you've observed is surprising, right? Uh, and I'll, I guess I won't explain in detail how to do that here. Um, but it's definitely... I think people more or less had the idea, well, you know, you have the model and the model is generating the data. The prior is an arbitrary choice, somewhat arbitrary choice by the analyst. How can the prior be wrong? Right? So how do you check a prior? There's no notion of theta being generated from the prior, for example. Right? So they had the idea that doesn't make sense, but I think it does. Is that okay? Yep, yep, that's helpful. Good. Now, there's another ingredient that I'm going to add here, and that's what I call the delta, the meaningful difference, because it, it crops up all the time. You know, we're measuring our data is the result of some measurement process. We measure it to some finite accuracy. So all the data is discrete. And it's even bounded, right? And, and these parameters and things that we want to know are also essentially finite, etc. Right? We can only know them to a certain accuracy, in other words, based on the uh, measurement process that we employ. And so that delta plays a role in what I'm going to say. So there's a distance measure on the set of possible values for psi. And so that if the, the difference between two of the values is less than or equal to this delta, then I don't distinguish them. And the, uh, the earliest paper I ever found on this is goes back to boring 1919, where he's complaining that people are not distinguishing between, I think he called it mathematical significance, but what he meant by that was scientific significance and, st and statistical significance, right? No, mathematical was statistical significance and scientific significance. So it's that, that idea, which we're all pretty familiar with, I think, in statistics. But it's interesting, we're still talking about it years over 100 years later now. Now, when I've got the model in the prior, I now have a joint probability model for the theta and the x. I'm not presuming the x, the data is observed yet. Now, here are the rules that I'm going to use when I derive my inferences. So I've got a probability model. Uh, I'm going to denote it usual notation for probability models, a sample space, a sigma field, and a probability measure. And my interest is in whether or not the event A is true. So I've, uh, some response has occurred, little omega. Is it in A or not? I don't know. But I do observe, I get some data. I observe that little omega, whatever it is, is in a set C. And I'll assume here that the probability of C is greater than zero, right? And here's my first principle, the principle of conditional probability. Initially, my beliefs about A are expressed by the probability of A. But as soon as I'm told that C has occurred, and I'm presuming here that this information is generated correctly, there's problems if it's not, right? These are like the Monty Hall problems. <laughs> things like that, but I'm presuming here this information comes is correctly generated, I replace my initial beliefs by my conditional beliefs, P of A given C. And now the more controversial part, I suppose, what I call, and I think others have called as well, the principle, principle of evidence. If the conditional probability, after I've seen, been told that C is true, is greater than my initial probability, then I have evidence in favor of A being true. If it's less than the initial probability, then I have evidence against A being true. And if it's the same, well, then A and C are statistically independent and I have no evidence one way or the other. That's something that's been discussed a lot in the philosophy of science uh, literature, not so much in statistics, but that is key and core to everything that I'm going to say and what I do. Now, those two principles are pretty important. The third one, sometimes I need this. Um, sometimes I need to order the evidence. I've got a set of possible values. 
and I need to order them. And I'm going to, for that, I'm going to use what I call the relative belief ratio, which is basically just the conditional probability divided by the prior probability. Uh, the posterior probability divided by the prior probability. Uh, and if that's bigger than one, I got evidence in favor. If it's less than one, I got evidence against. I don't need that for everything, but sometimes I do. Now, if I'm back in the statistical context, and I might even have a continuous model in that case where the prior probability of, a, of an event is zero, well, in that case, I define the relative belief ratio as a limit. I take a set of neighborhoods about the value of the, uh, that I'm interested in, psi, here. So A sub epsilon is the neighborhood of, of, of psi. And I look at the limit of the ratio of the posterior probability. That's what I mean by this symbol here. This is the posterior probability of that neighborhood, the true value being in that neighborhood, divided by the prior probability. And I let epsilon go to zero. And under very weak conditions, that turns out to be the ratio of the posterior density at psi to the prior density at psi. Now, what about inferences? So I want to answer those two questions, the E and the H question. And surprisingly, all I need is those three principles, okay? Uh, so I have an ordering of the different psi values according to the relative belief ratio, which is ordering them in the sense in, from how much, you know, there's evidence greater than, the, the relative belief ratio greater than one, it orders all the, all the values of psi which have the relative belief, belief ratio greater than one in terms of how much evidence they have in favor. And of the ones less than one, it orders them in terms of how much evidence there is against, right? So to estimate, I'm basically forced, if I'm going to use the relative belief ratio, to find the maximum value of the relative belief ratio. Now, the interest, more interesting part of that, perhaps, is, well, I want to say something about the accuracy of the estimate. And for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quote, and evidence... That part of the story, I think, is pretty clear. When it comes to the second part of my inferences, assessing accuracy or strength of evidence, that's a little more ambiguous. And in fact, there's not necessarily one number that you want to quote. There may be many things that you want to quote to assess accuracy or strength. But here, the fundamental concept, I believe, is what I call the plausible region. And what is that? That's this thing here. That's just a set of psi values for which there's evidence in favor. Okay, so I know this value, you can prove it actually, that the estimate, that called the relative belief estimate, lies inside the plausibility region. And so I'm going to measure the size of the plausibility region. And there's a bunch of ways you could do that. You could quote the volume if it's a Euclidean set. You could quote the prior probability. And you also probably should quote the, the posterior probability because that's measuring our belief, how, how strong our beliefs are that the true value is in that set. And that only, interestingly, uh, although I've expressed it in terms of the relative belief ratio, I don't need the relative belief ratio to define the plausible region. I could use some other valid measure of evidence. For example, the base factor is a, is a valid measure of evidence, and there's other ones. As they're valid if they agree with the principle of evidence, right? There's a cutoff such that bigger than the cutoff I've got evidence for, less than the cutoff I've got evidence against. So I could use some other valid measure of evidence to get my estimate up here, but they all lie in the plausible region, which is very nice. Now, what about hypothesis assessment? Well, right away, I've got a measure of evidence. I want to assess the hypothesis that psi is equal to psi naught. If the relative belief ratio with psi naught is bigger than one, I've got evidence for yes in favor. If it's less than one, I've got evidence against. And then I want to measure the strength, and there's various ways one can do that, but one of the more ways that works seems to work quite often is to calculate this posterior probability. What's my belief that the true value has a relative belief ratio less than or equal to the value, the hypothesized value? So if I've got evidence in favor and this is a big probability, that's telling me I have strong evidence in favor of the hypothesis. If I have evidence against and this is a small probability, that's telling me that I've got strong evidence against the hypothesis. That's the idea. Now, bias. And this is another, probably the more controversial, most controversial part of what I'm saying, at least to, to Bayesians, perhaps. But I think bias calculations are necessary if, as part of assessing the quality of a study. Should we accept, and this quote, I'll just read it, should we accept the results of a statistical analysis that reported evidence against or in favor of this hypothesis 
If the prior probability of obtaining such evidence was approximately one when H naught is true or false. And I think if you reported these characteristics of a study, so well, your prior probability of getting evidence against was even when it's true is 0.9 and you reported evidence against, well, that would say something about the quality of your study and your results, right? Um, this is connected in the, in the case when you've got evidence in favor, this is connected with what's known as the jeffries lindley paradox. And I would suggest that measuring bias in that case really tells us what's going wrong in the jeffries lindley context. Okay, so hypothesis. There's, there's two problems. I've got to tell you how to measure bias in both. So I want to measure the bias in my ingredients for the hypo po hypothesis that the true value of psi is psi naught. And the way I do that is I just calculate. Well, okay, the, the conditional probability, conditional prior probability, don't worry about the symbols, but this is the conditional prior probability, given that the null hypothesis is true, that I don't get evidence in favor. So if that's a big probability, I know my ingredients have bias against the null hypothesis. Similarly, for bias in favor, and this is where this meaningful difference comes in, I calculate the maximum probability of not getting evidence against H0 when it's meaningfully false. And basically what we want in a hypothesis assessment problem like this is we want both these probabilities to be small. If they're big, that's suggesting that there's a problem with, this, with the study. Whoops, I think I skipped a slide. Yes, for estimation, the bias against here, it's measured by, the cover, by one minus the coverage probability of um, the plausible region. What's the prior probability that the plausible region, remember the plausible region is a set of all values when the hypothesis was true, but actually I, now I'm integrating and averaging over all possible values of psi when estimation because I don't know what psi is. I'm asking here, well, what's the prior probability that the true value is not in the plausible region? If that's a big number, that big probability, then I have bias against in the estimation problem. And similarly for bias in favor, what's the prior probability that the implausible region, and the implausible region is the set of all values that have evidence against them. So the psi naught is false. What's the prob prior probability that I don't get it in the, in the implausible region, I don't get evidence against the psi naught. If that probability is big, then I have bias in favor. Well, I won't go through all, all of this here, but I'll just say this, that um, both biases can be controlled. They can be calculated in any of the two problems, and they can be controlled. How do you control them? Well, they go to zero when you increase. You can't look for a prior that that will minimize your biases because what happens is was one bias goes down, the other bias goes up. You're sort of seesawing a little bit, but the, main, the method for controlling bias, and that's part of the design of the problem, right? That uh, is the amount of data that you collect. Uh, and it turns out this, in the estimation problem, the coverage probability, this is basically a confidence. So, and it's the frequentist property. Of the, of the Bayesian inference, if you like, and it holds for any prior. I'm not looking for a prior that will give me good frequentist coverage probabilities. I'm gonna control the coverage probabilities by the amount of data that I collect. So this is a nice consequence, somewhat fortuitous, because I wasn't expecting it when I sort of started down this road, but this kind of provides a kind of unification between Bayes and frequentism. Namely, inferences are derived via Bayes, but the reliability quality of those inferences is assessed by frequency, frequentism. So my last slide, and this is what I call, at least the skeleton of what I would call my theory of statistical reasoning. First step is the hardest step, to choose a model. The second step, one elicits a prior. That, what I mean by that is based upon what you know about the phenomenon in question, you have to come up, come up with an argument for a prior. You don't go looking for one off the shelf, right? You, you're gonna have to think about it and come up with a prior. Of course, we have this, the, the delta, the characteristic of inference, interest, right? The um, meaningful dis difference for the characteristic of, of interest. Then you wanna measure the biases and use, um, based on your bias calculations, determine the amount of data that you wanna collect. 
once you've got the data, you can check your model. And if it's found to be wanting, then you're going to have to do something to fix it, right? Similarly, after you've checked the model, because if the model is wrong, there's no point in checking the prior, because the prior is relative to the model. If you've checked the model and you've not had any reason to reject it, uh, you check the prior. And again, you have, you have to modify that. And that's actually a much simpler problem. And there's some literature on my website, papers about my website about that. And then finally, there are the inference steps that I, that I just went through. And that, that comprises, for me at this point in time, at any rate, what I call a theory of statistical reasoning. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'll, I'll admit, uh, as someone who's basically, uh, well, by the time people see this, they'll have uh, seen some of the science for pseudoscience. Uh, this is a little bit of a step change for me, um, going from uh, reading about uh, uh, scientific philosophy uh, back into uh, a more uh, formal statistical form of argumentation. So, Well, one thing I, 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 I would say, if you've been reading about philosophy of science, is I think it's closely connected with some many of the things that are talked about in the philosophy of science, like the fa Popper's falsification, right? And also, I give the people, the philosophers of science, a great deal of credit for. There's lots of discussion in that literature about evidence, about statistical evidence, and in particular the principle of evidence, right? They they often find counterexamples to the principle of evidence, right? Things like Hempel's the Raven paradox and things like that. But I think when you cast these things in the statistical context, and this is in the book in part, that many of their paradoxes can be dealt with. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking maybe for people who are uh, just needing to get warmed up into the idea, what is, um, what would you say sort of subjectively or what, um, what are some of the core ideas that would help people sort of distinguish what you're discussing versus what they've already seen in their... Yeah. In their other, in their yes, the, the, the key, the key concept, the key idea, is to come up with a theory which is based upon characterizing or measuring statistical evidence as clearly as possible. Um, you know, we have ideas from frequentism, for example. I mean, my origins, by the way, are frequentism. I didn't. I, I slowly morphed into a Bayesian, and now I've kind of morphed into some hybrid of some kind, right, to a certain extent. But, you know, take how do we measure evidence in frequent statistics? The best one can come up with, I suppose, is the p-value. People make reference all the time, well, the evidence in the data says this. You know, oftentimes they use loss functions to derive statistical inference, like they use quadratic loss, right? We use quadratic loss. Well, the problem there is it's not falsifiable. I don't know how to falsify a loss function, right? that violates one of my requirements for um, 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 an ingredient to a statistical analysis. Um, so if from frequentism, if we thought about how one characterizes statistical evidence, it'd probably be via the p-value. And I think probably most of us now are quite familiar with many of the issues that arise via p-values. It just does not seem to be a very good tool for the assessment of evidence. If they have had some exposure to Bayesian inference, then they know about the base factor. Now, the base factor is closely related to what I call the relative belief ratio. It's just that the base factor is the ratio of the posterior odds in favor to the prior odds in favor. And plus, uh, there are some differences, too, with how people calculate base factors in practice. Typically, they're used for hypothesis assessment, and people employ what are called sharp sharp priors for the calculation of base factors. And if you don't employ a sharp fire prior and you define your base factor in the continuous case as a limit, as I did for the relative belief ratio, you get the relative belief ratio. And in fact, the base factor can always be defined in terms of the relative belief ratio, but not the opposite. So I, rather than base factor, which people are probably somewhat familiar with, I use the relative belief ratio, but the ideas are very similar. I also, I also demand that the relative belief ratio be calibrated, whereas what many people are doing in the literature, they just quote a, a base factor, and if it's a, bigger than a certain number, well, that's strong evidence if it's you know, this kind of thing in favor. And I think that's not correct. I think you have to calibrate these quantities. Does that help? Yeah, um, and I was just actually going to follow up. I, I didn't want to interrupt you, uh, but I, I did have a question a little bit earlier Um with regard to the p-value, because for example, um, when you talk about uh, the problems of the p-value, um, there are several 
there's some, I would say that there's some problems with the p-value and then there's some problems with the people using p-values. And yes. um, so I guess, could we just rewind on that one and just say, yeah, okay. I, would, I don't blame the, I, I don't, I don't really blame the people who use the p-value incorrectly because I think what they're searching for is a sensible measure of evidence. And the fact that the p-value does not behave sensibly, okay, you can criticize them for not understanding that, yes. But I think what we want is we want a measure of evidence that, that behaves properly. So and the p-value doesn't. For example, I can't get evidence in favor, right? Mm -hmm. It's not possible. Uh, well, that right away, that says something's wrong. And people try to justify that by saying, well, that's Pop Popper's falsification idea, right? We can only get evidence against. And I would counter argument, counter argue to that. And this goes back to, to thinking about reasoning. If we think about a, a logical argument, a logical argument with your deductive reasoning from one of your previous um, sessions, uh, there's two parts to that, right? There's the rules of inference that we apply to the premises, like modus, modus ponens, that kind of thing. And if we apply those rules correctly, we know that we have a valid conclusion based upon the ingredients. Now, the, ingre the premises here. Uh, the premises may be wrong in terms of the particular application, so then you don't have a sound argument. But still, I want to make the same split when I'm talking about statistical reasoning. So when I have the ingredients, I want to reason based upon those as being correct, and it means I want to be able to get it. They're correct. I want to be able to get evidence in favor or evidence against. Now, whether the ingredients are correct or not, that's the falsification part of the argument, the checking the model, checking the prior. In a logic, we separate those two activities. And I think we should do the same thing in statistics. Cool. And I guess uh, on the issue of logically separating the two activities, um, let's rewind and talk a little bit about, um, for example, prior checking. Yeah. Um, so I guess there are a few ways that would come to mind from that. Um, and I'm probably not enumerating them all, but uh, I would consider some of them, for example, being um, effectively there is you know, actual prior data um, against which we can compare the priors. Um, there is also, for example, um, so that's like concrete prior data. And then I'd say yeah. there's also the issue of essentially uh, domain knowledge where effectively, um, because there's been such a large amount of data or a large amount of knowledge about the nature of some of these parameters, um, that someone might not feel like they need to be referencing a specific type of data in order to derive their prior. So they might say, uh, I'll just use an example from Bosan, uh, that, um, that for example, a uh, patient heart rate might be very specifically in a certain range. And they might not want to say, I'm using specifically the, I don't know, the uh, frame name study, or uh, I'm using specifically this study or this data set to define that. Mm -hmm. But effectively, there's enough domain knowledge that they feel comfortable defining it. And then there's also an issue of, uh, for example, uh, people actually d deriving their prior from the data currently under consideration of analysis. And I know that this this happens quite a bit. For example, um, uh, just a quick example, like uh, in a lot of uh, frequently Gaussian process work, for example, where people essentially, they like the sort of machine learning method of setting your mean to zero, and therefore you basically scale and... Uh, uh, relocate your data and effectively your prior is informed by what the data is currently. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you go back to, uh, first of all, the the formalities here are the inference step. Mm -hmm. Well, how one checks a model, how one checks a prior, there's lots of different ways that one can do that. You want some properties, you want you want whatever method you're using to have some kind of consistency property, you know, that it does I increase the amount of data that I that I have that I'm going to detect model failure or I'm going to detect problems with my prior. And the methods that I employ and are discussed in the book do satisfy those properties. Um, the other the other um, aspect of of, of your comment is, and, and you know, you, you yes, you could use other data. I don't. I, that's not really what how I've looked at the problem. I've based the problem on or, or checking the prior on the actual data that I have. Okay, the um, and there's methodology for doing that that is that is consistent, right? Uh, the problem of using a prior that is based upon the uh, data that you've observed 
Now that I have a problem with. Why? Well, if you looked at those rules that I wrote down for inference, the first rule, and I, I would call this the, the rock on, what, on which statistics is built, is the principle of conditional probability. And when you're basing your using the data to construct your prior, well, you're immediately violating that. Now, you know, there's, there's another aspect of all of this. I, I was careful at the start of my talk to say, I'm talking about the ideal circumstance, right? Uh, you know, Tukey, John Tukey, a famous statistician, I always remember him, used to talk about exploratory data analysis and confirmatory data analysis. So uh, I, I have a feeling that what I'm doing is confirmatory. People will do all sorts of crazy things in exploratory, and I don't, I don't want to stop them from doing it, to, to perhaps find something that they would later subject to a confirmatory analysis. But definitely, I would rule out in, in terms of the ideal the idea that you can base your priors, have your priors dependent upon the observed data uh, without, you know, there's being some kind of independence or something of the data that you're going to use to do that. Yeah, uh, the main use uh, when I've seen uh, things like that, it's mainly, well, um, one, obviously it's a controversial issue, um, but it is a controversial in the sense of the effect of you're not actually being Bayesian in some in some regard. And well, you know, the great thing about sorry to interrupt, but the great thing about Bayesian inference, at least if it's done with proper priors, is that you're within this is why I ultimately come to believe that inference is Bayesian. It's that you're you're putting yourself within the context of a full probability model. Your reasoning happens within the context of probability. The other methods, what they're essentially trying to do is to invent other ways of reasoning that are outside of probability. Maybe that's possible. I don't know. I can't prove that it is impossible. I have my doubts <laughs> based upon reading and studying, et cetera, over many years. At any rate, I know the core is probably, I feel the core is probably Bayesian. I stay within the context of probability. I don't go outside of of probability theory. And when you do what you are describing, that's effectively what you're doing. You're going outside. I mean, conditional probability is, a, is an axiom of probability, right? It, and it's the first axiom of inference, I believe. So in an exploratory analysis, if that's something that you want to do, I, I certainly can't stop you, but I want you to be honest about it in reporting your results. And I, I would not accept that as being good statistical reasoning. Yeah, I guess the uh, some of the context in which it's used, for example, is when uh, essentially where you might have a, and I'm, I'm not using this, I'm just providing the argumentation. Um, I'm not particularly endorsing it. Um, well, one of the things is just when, you know, it's just useful where the people just say, you know, it might not actually adversely affect what you're trying to do. Yeah, um, <laughs> well, that's right. But I'm a purist. Yeah. Right, I'm a purist. I don't know what these words useful and, you know, and, and qualitative comments about how, what its influence. I don't fully understand what those mean. Now, there's another way in which that could be employed and I think could be part of formal statistical reasoning. Namely, you think of collecting a certain amount of data first and use that to build a prior. And then use that prior based upon that data. Don't use that data as part of the inference step. And subject that prior to the... Um, analyses that I talked about, right? The checking for prior data conflict, measuring bias, that kind of thing. So I don't rule out the possibility of using a prior that's data-based, but I don't want the prior to be fully based. I know I can't use the prior based fully based, based on the full data set because that's going to violate one of the basic principles of inference. Yeah, actually, that sounds quite a bit closer to what um, how I uh, did things. Uh, because just very simply, although I'll say I had the advantage of a very large amount of data and a very strong reason on which uh, not only did I have a large amount of data, but I had a very good reason knowing that I could basically hold out some data and have my ah, sort yeah. of more, uh, I, I was essentially, I was never penalized for having my um, my idealism, if you will. Um, and I'll just give you the context on that real quick, because maybe, maybe it would be fun to talk a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. derivation of priors, because we actually haven't talked about that much. I just realized, um, yeah. as you're saying that, uh, we haven't talked about that much, uh, not only on this series, but in the podcast as a whole. Um, which well, it doesn't get that much talked about. How many papers do you see 
uh, in the literature talking about elicitation of priors. Actually, I started back a few years ago. Every time I talk about a Bayesian problem in a in a paper now, I say how I'm going to elicit the prior. I, uh, but, my, oh yeah, sorry. no, 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 my, my, uh, my way of, uh, grabbing some priors was actually, um, I, uh, did a, uh, Bayesian optimization regime. So it actually looked around from the previous day that we had and essentially picked out, uh, personalized priors for the individual patient. So the idea was like, if you're, if you have hundreds of patients under observation, this is for, uh, I guess you've seen some of the stuff where basically we have these personalized time series models and, um, they are, um, we want to use priors to regularize the time series. Mm -hmm. And essentially, um, there are obviously an infinite number of priors. And the question is like, how do you measure how well they do? And uh, basically, my thing was saying, okay, if we, um, if we do it, treat this as sort of like a black box optimization problem, and we say, how do we parameterize these priors? And saying like, can we find good parameterizations? And can we grow the, um, the prior parameterizations? Um, to sufficient complexity mm -hmm. such that they actually just, these priors are good at describing the patient for things, for tasks like forecasting and things like that. But um, I guess very quickly, just to uh, just to maybe kick off um, a conversation on uh, selecting priors, um, mm -hmm. I'll I'll say what I did and it's open for critique. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be the punching bag on this one. So, <laughs> um, which it, it, it's only fair, um, I guess. Uh, so what I did was... Um, we have these patient uh, time series, and we know that, for example, um, a patient's vital sign for, say, respiratory rate, how fast they breathe, um, we know that it probably falls between about uh, maybe five breaths per minute, two breaths per minute on the lowest end. It can be upwards of you know 60 breaths per minute on the highest end if they're in a severe phys physiological state. Um, and so we know that it falls in this broad range, whatever, um, and this affects also how quickly, for example, they can change. And uh, so the magnitudes of these priors and things like that. So um, we know we, we know that on a population level that they can encompass this wide range. But we also know that the moment we've observed an individual patient, that population prior becomes just insufficient. And like you can just immediately uh, crunch the probability space down to a much, much more precise area. Mm -hmm. And um, so again, the reason it's, why it's related to the particular person is that is that yeah the yeah by virtue of it being an individual person, an individual person uh, falls in a much much more constrained range than the overall population. Um, and so the reason that we want to update these with regard to the person because effectively you have this big floppy prior that doesn't do any form of regularization. I would actually go so far as to say a prior based on a global distribution like that doesn't actually reflect our prior belief. Like uh, it's definitively not what I believe because I believe that they would actually fall in this much smaller range. Mm -hmm. So um, the advantage of having essentially this very high high frequency data was that I could grab, say the first five minutes, first 10 minutes, even sometimes the first observation, I tinkered around with this or actually said, just give me the first observation, like out of something that's a secondly acquired data, just give me the very first observation. And I'd set, I'd rather set that as my prior mean mm -hmm. than say I'm going to be agnostic and I'm set it to the population mean. Um, yeah. And so, a couple of comments. Yeah. First of all, you're right about diffuse priors, which is, um, which are often used. I was reviewing a paper over the past couple of days or a couple of weeks, I guess it would be rather, and. The person in the paper was referencing, they were going to use a diffuse prior. It was normal with mean zero and with variance 10 billion. <laughs> and it was actually built into a software package, right? The, uh, that prior. There's problems with diffuse priors, no doubt. And that's the Jeffries Lindley paradox, by the way. And what you find when you look at the Jeffries Lindley paradox, there's a paradox. So as the, that context, when the, as the prior becomes more diffuse, the bias in favor goes to one. And this explains, for me at least, what the Jeffries Lindley paradox is all about. You don't want to use a prior that, even though you think that I'm being non-informative by taking a, prior, a very diffuse prior, in fact, you're biasing things in favor of a hypothesis in that case, the, the particular context discussed. Now the other thing you just sorry. intuitively, just intuitively yep. on that, are you, when you say it's a biasing things in favor, um, is the idea that effectively any aspect of the prior that would contradict the data is being washed away, or um, on an intuitive level, what? Well, I can explain it in terms of that prior probability, right? The 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 well, first of all, 
whether it's the relative belief ratio, it's the Bayes factor in that particular problem, or it's the posterior probability. They all converge to the maximum value as the prior becomes more and more diffuse. Okay, so you got a, just you got a normal mu naught sigma naught squared or tau naught squared. So tau naught squared goes to infinity. All these measures of evidence go to their maximum value, even when the hypothesis is false. Okay, so that's bias. And we can measure that before we actually... So I'm going to use this prior. I can measure that bias before I actually see the data. So, oh, well, gee, if I want to use a prior with a variance of 10 billion, I'm going to have to collect an awful lot of data to make sure I don't have... I'm not biasing things in favor. And again, bias in favor means I'm going to get evidence in favor of the null hypothesis, even when it's meaningfully false. Okay? So is, is that okay? That... that that's how yeah, uh, yeah, that's good. my response to um, diffuse priors. Now, the second thing you talked about was using part of the data to derive a prior. I have no problem with that. And I don't think it contradicts anything that I said, as long as that data is also not part of the inference part. But also, I think there's this critique, right, that, that one, should, one has to go through, is to say, okay, do I have bias? even with the prior I chose based upon previous data. And also, when I get my new data, is the new data contradicting that prior? Because maybe something, you know, in the case of if your patients, maybe something dramatically has changed over the five minutes or something like that. I don't know. I, I think there's a formal, a formal procedure that one could apply to the context that you're talking about. And, and almost certainly, I guess this, the first part comment is that taking some arbitrarily diffuse prior, which is probably what you're talking about, the big floppy prior, right, uh, is not the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause basically, um, I always felt like I had managed to dodge essentially a Bayesian bullet on that one where, um, you know, um, I, I, I essentially, I had enough data where I could do such a thing. Yeah. Um, and I, I recognize that it has empirical value for things like forecasting and for, uh, fitting the model. Um, you know, when it comes to like automated time series model fitting, it's not an easy it's not an easy task. You know, the right. number of things that can go when you have to automate um, the, these models is, uh, the number of things that can go wrong is very high. So anything that you can do to add certainty or to add precision in some way when you are going back and checking these models after they're fit, um, you know, obviously there's a very big attraction to that. But I also felt like if I, for example, had lower, um, if my acquisition of data um, was at a lower rate, I might have been really tempted just to keep that data and just basically say, um, you know, they not not been as uh, ideal in my rigorous about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, oh. Again, again, you know, I mean, when you're talking about an ideal, it's an ideal, and of course, when we get into the real world, ideals never really hold, right? Do we ever really, truly, randomly sample from any populations? Maybe once in a while. <laughs> you know, uh, even by clinical luck, by random luck. <laughs> well, even clinical trials are not really, you know, pure random samples, right? right They're precisely not random samples, right? So it's an ideal, and but the importance is to have the ideal in mind. So knowing that you're violating some ideal, what do you do about that? What caveats do you express when you talk about your results? Right? I mean, I think. It's important for statistics to have that ideal, have that core to the subject. I mean, to be honest with you, part of the reason I got on this was more teaching statistics than it was working in practical applications because I kept trying to teach statistics to introductory students, which I had to do every year for many years. And uh, I never really could come up with a, a, a development of the subject that really satisfied me. And that's really what, what I'm talking about here, is to find some development of the subject that satisfies me, that I'm, I'm telling people about some kind of formal, formal reasoning process that I feel fairly confident is correct. I can never prove it's correct. And it may be that somebody can find a terrible counterexample that will sink my ship. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, but I do, I do like the idea of essentially having some formal process or some formal ideal against which to contrast their own work. Yeah. Um, I think that's important for the subject, really. Yeah, and even um, even if someone were to choose, I'll, uh, well, screw it, it's my podcast, I'll say what I want. Even if someone were to say, 
choose a non-ideal one. You know, and I'm not saying just go completely bonkers and throw everything out the window, but some something where um, it seems that it would be better to be operating off essentially a bad plan, which would be maybe an ideal an ideal system, which might be misspecified in some way, um, than having zero plan at all. So I guess part of what I'm what I'm listening to what you're saying yeah. is uh, the the contrast might obviously when you're much more ingrained in your subject because obviously you work on it and there are a number of people who are more ingrained and probably have more uh, more skin in the game. But for me, when I'm uh, thinking about this, the main, when I see how people actually practice data science and practice statistics, the main contrast between what you're saying and what people do in practice is the difference between having a plan, having an ideal and having nothing there. Um, right, right, and right. so, yeah, and, and also, you know, this idea of just, Default priors, for example. Yeah. Default models, default priors. Well, we know the models are always wrong. I think it's Box who said that, right? And it's, of course, the models are these ingredients that we put in, like models, like priors. Our goal here is not to define, not to define the correct model, is not to find the correct prior. Our goal is to answer those questions. Those are the questions that come from the science, the E and the E and or the H, right? Those are the questions that come from the science. That's our goal. These ingredients that we put in there, well, they're just devices so that we can reason. But we have to be careful. So that if we put these ingredients in and they're crazy ingredients, well, why would we trust the results? I would suggest we shouldn't, right? And also it, the issue of replicab replicability comes into the story a bit, right? If we want our results to be replicable, they have to be a at least... It, obeying some formal principles of some kind. You can't just be ar completely arbitrary. I remember years ago, and this is uh, about a paper that got rejected. I, was, I sent it to a machine learning journal. And basically, I was pointing out about, they use Bayesian methods, and they use uh, posterior modes quite often. MAP, maximum a posteriori. And I was pointing out that the relative belief inferences, they're all invariant to parametrizations. It doesn't matter how I parametrize the model. I will just can transform back and choose a, a, a parametrization where it's convenient to do my computations, do my computations there, and just simply transform back to the parameters, parameter of interest, right? There's no problem. But as map, well, if I, I have to care, be careful about the parametrization, and it might not be the parametrization of interest, then I got, well, I got a problem. I can't just transform back. I got a, a completely different problems, optimization problems. So... Well, what they wanted me to do was to show that my method worked on a bunch of different data sets <laughs> compared to MAP. And my res I refused. My response was, well, no, logically, this is just better. And they rejected the paper. Yeah, no, <laughs> <Too bad. I'm, laughs> yeah as someone who's definitely in the machine learning community, I am uh, sympathetic to the... Um, it's annoying sometimes when people realize that there is more to there's more to reasoning than just empirical comparison. Yeah, right. that, um, what does it prove? It, you, you could get one data set where a map would work better than 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 the relative belief estimate. You know, I don't see any reason why you, it would look better. Like even in a simulation, it might look better. Yeah, that's um, is, I, it's actually um I, I've you know I've if you've been listening I've, I've been I, I've pointed this out a number of times where my uh, distaste for for example the battle of the algorithm approach to uh, scientific discovery and right. uh, advancement where essentially the purpose of a paper is essentially to compare an ROC curve or some forecasting like some metric um, and effectively the entire paper then becomes it revolves around just comparing two algorithms or two. Or three or four or yeah. five. I've seen uh, them like that, right, yeah. as well, right? There are yeah. multiple algorithms, and sometimes one's better than another, et cetera. Well, you know, I, I guess my, my thrust is to go back to some basic principles that tell us what we're supposed to do as much as possible. Yeah, and just... Because I think that gives a power to, to statistical reasoning. This is what we're all doing. We're all reasoning statistically, right? But if, if, it's, if it can be anything, then it's nothing. Yeah, and it is... It is bothersome just to circle back the idea of having if you have a good strong valid deductive argument uh for some conclusion you know that um the the the, the value of our deductive argumentation um is that it cannot be nullified by empirical reasoning you know uh, for example uh except if the premises are wrong and like yeah well yeah but yeah yeah so um but the the right the but it's is, very important that the you're right you're very important that the reasoning as long as they've proved their theorem 
they've they've not violated any principles of logic that uh, the theorem holds. Yeah. Actually, it reminds me, um, that this is a bit of a tangent, and I'm a little bit worried because I know you're at Toronto, but it reminds me of, um, there's a Radford Neal paper. I think, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I think he was talking about, it's like, oh, man, I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm sweating over here now. Uh, but, you know, the... Um, I, th I think it might have been his um, something on one of his slice sampling where he was discussing mm -hmm. um, he was discussing the reasoning behind it, and it was just written text of his reasoning, um, and it was um, I don't recall very much mathematics in it at all, but it was amazingly helpful, and it was like it was it was a well reasoned piece, uh, and wow. and I'm just, part of me was just things like. That's something that only someone like uh, like Radford Neal's uh, status could do because everyone else would just be like, ah, oh, show us the math and uh, show, show us some limiting, whatever. And he just he just talked through the reasoning of it. Right. And I, I think it was a refreshing thing. I, th I think it was a completely Well, you know, if you, if you yeah. can't explain your, your, your mathematics in good, clear English terms, right, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem. So, uh, yeah. I mean, Radford was a pretty, well, he's retired now, actually, but he's a pretty deep thinker, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah. I mean, in, in his in his case, it was, I think, actually, it's, it's now coming back to me. I think it was, he was explaining why um, his sampler had a, uh, actually exhibited the Markov property. And he just uh -huh. wrote it out one way and then said, okay, now, and then we're going to go back the next, other way. Um, and, yeah, anyway, um, yeah, no, I, I think that is very helpful and obviously... Well, I yeah. think one other thing I would say about what I'm proposing, this approach, is as far as the inference goes, it's dead easy. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy computationally, but from the point of view of principles, right, it's, it's very simple. I mean, if you look at other axiomatizations of Bayesian inference, for example, the Savage axioms, it was like seven or eight, I forget the exact number, and some of them I don't even really believe. <laughs> so uh, this is very, and it's really the principle of evidence. That's really something that 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 people should think about. I mean, I've get you know sometimes I'll get reviews, anonymous reviews will say they don't find the principle of evidence intuitive. And be, again, the principle of evidence is if the probability goes up when you condition on the data, you got evidence for. When if it goes down, you got evidence against in the data. Right? The data is telling you to believe less, more strongly, or less strongly about whatever the hypothesis or or event in question is. And some people claim that it's not intuitive, whereas to me, it seems very intuitive and very simple. And all the inferences that I talk about in the different papers and whatnot, they all der essentially derive from that. Cool. And um, I guess since I know that we are running out of your time a little bit, uh, what would be some good, I guess, final, I'll let you decide sort of the final topic and um, what, what, what the final idea that we kick around is. Oh, that's, um, well, I, I guess I, I've already gone on about we need to have a theory of statistical reasoning that we collectively, as a discipline, as a subject, identify as being correct statistical reasoning. And that's what I'm aiming at in my research and what I'm presenting, my papers that I write and uh, books, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, there's resistance to that too, right? I mean, because there are different, Different points of view about what is the right way. I mean, if you have frequentism, I was going to say, it's like, well, what do we do with the apostates? You know, um, whoever whoever runs afoul, like, what happens to them? What what is their place? Um, you know, I don't I don't know the answer to this the sociological question. Right? Like that. I, I don't know. I mean, um, I mean I'm, skepticism is good, and so you should be skeptical of what I'm saying. I, I, I don't have any problem with somebody being skeptical. They should not accept what I say. But at least maybe think about it. Give it a read. You look, give see it a read. Give it a try. Yeah, give it a, give it a try. See, see what you think. And if you find something about it that you find particularly offensive, well, let me know. I, 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 I'm not saying I'm anxious to hear about it. <laughs> but it'd be better for me to hear about it. And I won't waste my time. Cool. Um, just actually, that maybe that's a good place to end. Um, obviously, uh, you're both familiar with your work and possibly critiques of your work. What are sort of the strongest critiques of it at the moment, just to give the other side a... a well, as I said, the, 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 the most recent ones were some referees who did not see that the principle of evidence was um, uh, intuitive. 
I, I found that one very hard to take, but okay, I, I have to accept it. That's and, and I responded to them in my response uh, to the reviewers. Um, and, and you know, of course, frequentists they will. There's a lot of prejudice in statistics. You know that, right? So I mean, there there are people who say I don't want anything to do with priors. Well, it's kind of a non-thinking approach to the whole problem. And I, I, and I was like that when I started, right? I mean, I was raised as a frequentist, and I thought that Bayesianism was some kind of anti-science movement. Uh, at least that's what I was taught. And uh, I believed it for a long time. I slowly changed. Uh, I'm not a religious Bayesian by any means. In fact, I think probably most Bayesians don't like what I say because I have this business about the bias and about checking priors. I mean, there are some Bayesians who say you cannot check models, you cannot check priors. That's incoherent. And to me, that just takes the whole subject out of the realm of science. Is that a lot of them? Is, it, is, it, is, it, is that? I think it's a fading, a fading, you yeah. know, that's Lindley's incoherence and, you know, from Definetti's um, arguments for probability, which are profound arguments. I, you know, I, I think reading Definetti, it's like, well, that's a revelation to me because I'm always told that probability is long run relative frequency, et cetera, right? And Definetti is, you know, you read it, well, a very strong arguments and, well, probability is can be assigned in many different ways. That's what I would say. But somehow, some of the Bayesians, I think, took Definiti's ideas to an extreme. And I think they're a very much, very small minority now. Most people are more practically oriented. But I think you can actually do all of that within a formal context and not just be practically oriented, but actually put this stuff put the checking for priors, the measuring bias, and this kind of thing, and the frequentism, I think you can put that into the story in a, in a logically coherent way. Maybe I'll get lots of email about that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I was, it, it, it was just, uh, it was sending my thoughts back a little bit about um, some of the other sort of, um, I would say, uh, critiques of uh, Bayesianism in practice, where um, effectively it seems like there is, um, it, it reminds me of, uh, for example, uh, Andrew Gelman, when he was talking about, you know, people not checking their uh, uh, posterior predictive checking and things like that, and uh, saying, it's like, oh yeah, and we really need to prevent that. And I guess maybe to some extent, he did a good enough job combating it, where um, like what I was reading about, it's like, wait, I, I, don't, I don't know anyone who does that. Um, and, you know, it's like, and again, it could have been something, well, obviously, you know, he was talking about when he was just out of grad school and he was basically seeing all these Bayesian models and people weren't checking um, whether or not the data actually aligned. Made sense. It, whether the models and, and priors made sense in light of the, you know, I'm, I'm close to what Andrew is talking about. Yeah. The only difference is I don't do posterior checks. Right. I do prior checks, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, this is, um, it, it seems like some, some of these things were effective. It's one of the nice things about having like a, a record of literature where it's like, ah, this was actually, it's a nice record of what people were doing in some uh, missteps that they took, so you don't do them again. But it also means that I think, fortunately, uh, influential thinkers have been influential enough that some of the things that they were previously talking about, I don't think are particularly well. You know, as you said, it's it's being pushed to the periphery. It's been a, now a minority of Bayesians, for example. Yeah. Cool. Well, you don't want to be too rigid, I, I suppose, in your thinking. But on the other side, you also don't want to be too loose in your thinking. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to get to the point where every, anything goes. And to a certain extent, I don't. Maybe this is an unfair criticism, but I kind of feel like that is the state of statistics this day, these days. It's a little bit like anything goes almost. There's no, there's no looking to a core that tells us, well, maybe that doesn't go. Right? Maybe maybe we should be doing something a little bit different, right? There's some principles that that force us, you know, I, I don't base a prior on all the data, for example, because I'm going to violate the principle of condition. I mean, you can do it in an exploratory way. I mean, I, 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 I don't have, I can't, we can't stop people from exploring data and we, we probably don't want to do it, right? But in terms of what the formal theory of statistics says, I would doubt very much whether that would become a component of it. Yeah, it, it reminds me in some way of the idea of, um, you, you might be familiar with the term like data-driven science um, versus, for example, and I put this very much in contrast to hypothesis-driven science. And um, to some extent, I think that these, you know, when you talk about, you know, the anything goes approach to statistics or the anything goes, well, to whatever extent anything goes in statistics, extra anything goes for uh, data science <laughs> and practice like that. So like, 
Um, and it does worry me when essentially people don't have a strong, um, not only should you have a strong hypothesis about like the data that you're now analyzing and things like that, but um, I think people should have a very strong hypothesis about um, the way in which, the proper way in which to analyze their data. And obviously you can be open to, you can change your method, you can be open to critique. Uh, you have to be, because otherwise you might just run off blindly. But I think probably the worst thing that uh, data scientists, data analysts can do is effectively have a data-driven approach to data science. Because unlike, um, say, a lab scientist who, if they do a data-driven approach to science, you, they can never be truly data-driven because they're busy actually interacting with the physical process, the data right. generative process. So I don't think that, um, I think that statistics and data science might be especially prey to the challenges of data-driven science because effectively we're already in just the data. And so when well, we the other thing it, is too, you, you want to serve the, 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 the client if, in a sense, right? The, that people want answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that certainly when you're working as an applied stat, I mean, my daughter's a medical scientist and they do research on liver disease. And uh, she brings me data to do, to analyze for her. Guess what? I compute p-values. <laughs> You know, because that's the standard in the literature where she publishes, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I guess I, I'm not saying to everybody out there who's a practicing statistician or a practicing data science, do thou must do things this way. But I do think, again, that, that, that we want to try to identify a core for our subject so that we're not just going off in all sorts of different directions. What's right? What's wrong? You know, some people are completely anti-Bayesian. Some people are completely anti-frequentist, right? Um, what's right and what's wrong? Is, is it possible for there, for there to be a right and a wrong? I, I'm an optimist. I think there is. Oh, well, yeah. I guess maybe on that optimistic note, Mike, thanks so much for your time today. Well, I, thanks I again that, for having me. I yeah, enjoyed no, it. it's, yeah, it's definitely great. Um, I'll, I'll keep rambling on a second because, you know, you're here now. We might as well talk a bit. But yeah, okay, um, sure. Yeah, but no, I, I do appreciate when you reaching out and uh, outlining some of these ideas for me. And um, obviously, uh, for those listening, um, I'm pop popping uh, some of uh, Mike's links in the description of the video, so you can very quickly hop onto his website and start looking at papers. Um, I guess I might as well also just plug, uh, if you like this, uh, leave a like and a comment. Uh, well, while you're there, um, this will make sure that uh, it'll tell the YouTube algorithm to uh, show more people this video. So, uh, but yeah, um, just while I remember that. Um, uh, <laughs> but yeah, my no. first you, my my first real YouTube video, by the way. Oh, uh, cool. Well, there. I, I, if you like Mike or the idea or challenges, yeah, definitely leave a like. Not because it approves of Mike, but because it shows more people <laughs> in the video. Um, yes. but yeah, but no, I, I think I think that this is this is helpful. And even um, obviously, I'm not as I was not familiar with um, your work before you got in contact with me. Um, but it, it was helpful to start, uh, again, just trying to wrap my well, mind. Well, it's videos. very helpful to me too, because I'm, I'm trying to make more people aware of, of, of this discussion, this point. It's really about the foundations of statistics, which I think is, for me, it's the most important problem. It's an important problem in science, I think. If people are going to be doing all kinds of data analyses, uh, data science, machine learning, whatever, I, all these problems to me, at their core, they're all the same, essentially. You know, so uh, getting some foundations for the subject is important, that we're just not all heading off in different directions and one has no idea what's right and what's wrong. Cool. Well, Mike, thanks again for your time. And well, thank you. Hey, guys, it's Glenn. Thanks for your time today. I hope you liked today's episode. If you did, please consider smashing that like button. It's the single, simplest, fastest way to make sure that YouTube shows this video to more people. If you really want to go crazy, consider subscribing or going to our website and joining the mail list. If you want to go totally crazy beyond that, forward this to a friend or colleague who you think might enjoy this too. We're a small channel and every bit helps. Our next episode will be coming out next week. So in the meantime, feel free to look around the channel and see other videos that might be of interest. As a quick disclaimer, the views expressed in the show do not represent anything other than the people saying those words, views, et cetera, like that. It doesn't mean anything about their employers or their employers' views or some thing about their employers or their neighbor's cat or anyone else not saying the words. And in fact, given that people tend to change their views when they're thoughtful enough, it might not even represent the views of the speaker by the time you're hearing the episode. So definitely come back and see if they've changed their views at a later date.
They also don't represent the views of our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsors. You can check them out on our website. 